So, I'm really glad to be here, having been in Italy yesterday. Um, <laughs> and good afternoon to you all. Uh, the weather has followed us, right? I mean, it's lovely. Okay, as it happens, this is a moment in periodical studies. In the last nine months, three compendious representations of the field have appeared that attempt to scope its extent and character. So Andrew King, Alexis Easley, and John Morton's collective volume, The Routledge Handbook to 19th Century British Periodicals and Newspapers, Joanne Shaddock's collection, Journalism and the Periodical Press in 19th Century Britain from CUP, and the third series of John North's ambitious Waterloo Directory of English Newspapers and Periodicals, 1800 to 1900, which exists online and in print. Two points about these titles. They all deal with the entire century rather than the Victorian period or some adjustment of it. For example, what Wellesley tried to do, um, constructing a period between 1824 and 1900. You know, very uncomfortable between the tension of the century, I mean, the periodization question. And none of these projects any longer use the term Victorian. They deftly wrap what used to be separate, romantic, and Victorian in a narrative of continuity. So, f and, and this kind of narrative, of course, makes you know, immense sense in respect of the 19th century press. You know, with the origins of the particularly 19th century generation of reviews, um, I'm thinking about the Edinburgh, the um, Quarterly Review, uh, and in 1824, the um, Westminster, you know, originating at the very beginning of the century and, you know, and existing and, and, you know, and vibrantly right through, while other things, you know, um, other periodicals, um, including um, um, Chambers Magazine and, um, you know, The Spectator and so on, were all pre-1837. You know, so it does not make very much sense at all in terms of the press to think about Victorian. And you know, I think it's a term that we need to problematize. I mean, of course, it is problematized, but I think we do need to think about you know the 19th century and and the problems of, of periodization like that. These this going continuing with this moment, um, these three works signal a tide of work that has been rising since the founding of dedicated periodicals such as the iterations of Victorian Periodical Review and Media History. Uh, some 50 years ago, um, and here they are, you know, now and current and what we use and turn to. Um, um, so this is, a, you know, this is a field or a series of fields that has developed from the mid 20th century. That's really what's happening here. And they were accompanied by the serial publication from 1866 of um, something called the Wellesley Index, so this was uh, an attempt to unlock uh, the periodical press by creating simply, well, simply I say, a list of the contents of each issue of, um, of 43 out of 50,000 uh, titles in the press. And they did that, uh, you know, that very um, English literature thing. They tried to um, unmask the anonymity that had been so carefully cultivated, <laughs> uh, so, uh, you know, to uh, find the authors of these individual titles, and they also left a print on the Wellesley Index that we still think, you know, about um, uh, as a period print. Um, they decided to exclude the poems uh, because they thought the poetry in periodicals was filler, and that it was largely written by women. So they don't appear in the first two volumes of the Wellesley. You know, so we all, you know, however definitive, you know, I mean, it was a groundbreaking work. There's no question about it. Um, it was produced serially in five volumes. Uh, it was abandoned by Wellesley College almost immediately it appeared, and it moved uh, elsewhere. And um, this opening up of these 43 titles, um, from very um, um, high culture journals, that is monthlies and quarterlies. No weeklies, you know, no penny papers, um, you know, the high culture journals, um, a selection of them, um, initiated a swell of research 
and, you know, and, and really had a huge tale of productive work that was, that was you know, fueled by the uh, exposure of what the journals contained. Um, and then, so we have an index, we have the periodicals, um, and then a mere decade ago, um, the Dictionary of 19th Century Journalism, which is a dictionary, so another you know, uh, kind of approach to the press, which of course in its, um, uh, in its scope, in the amount of it, you know, not only 50,000 titles, but you know, all running on serially, uh, is very daunting. And it needs ways of, you know, as um, um, Scott Bennett put it, you know, hilariously, but shockingly, he said, we're all seeking bibliographical control of this huge corpus of work. So this dictionary of short articles uh, is on the usual su suspects, that is newspaper and periodical titles, editors, journalists, illustrators, printers, publisher proprietors, but it also includes terms for critical analysis such as paper or frequency or media replication, scissors and paste, foreign correspondence, answer columns. You know, so it's trying to produce um, a list of um, um, subjects, as it were, all together in which the press might be discussed. Uh, and a discourse might um, include. So these different forms, this, the periodicals, the index, the dictionary, the kinds of work that the three um, current publications of Joanne Shaddix, of Andrew Kings, and of um, the Waterloo Directory, they are all helping to fuel research. And cumulatively, I would say that their um, project is to define the field. I mean, it's attempting to create a field. Meanwhile, as it were, in parallel, over the last 15 years, digital projects of various types supplemented the bound paper volumes found in geographically distributed libraries. Single titles were digitized, some from extant microfilm, some afresh. So we have a very mixed um, origin of these, um, you know, repl replications, media replications of what we think of um, in short form as copies. Uh, but in fact are quite different from uh, whatever they've been copied from. Um, it's a form of media replication that transformed the sources largely in bound volumes of print into a new material culture of the digital that with developing software permitted readings and other formats of analysis by users from searching, you know, uh, which, is, which appears now to be routine and at the beginning of this reconstitution, as it were, of the press to text mining which is you know, at, um, a more complex um, um, stopping point, but clearly ongoing. Commercial companies such as Gale and ProQuest digitized individual titles that were soon aggregated on ever-growing sites. And these sites, unlike the individual titles, bypass individuals, and they're only purchasable by libraries, public institutions, um, and grant-making bodies such as the British Library, often in partnership with private companies, uh, produce them. And I think that one of the things that um, the digital um, um, accessibility, if you like, and the projects uh, around the press, um, the printed press, have brought to our attention is, the, um, is aspects of the press that we haven't, uh, of, of, if you like, the print, printed press, that we haven't always remembered are part of the qualities, I mean, I'm thinking of, you know, what bibliographers used to sequester away, you know, the publishers, um, the distribution cycles, you know, the ways in which different editions were circulated. I mean, the kind of thing that um, um, we think about when we discuss uh, reprints. I mean, I'm talking about book history here, when we think about reprints, so that the, you know, mid 20th century focus on, quote, the text has been, I think, uh, enriched, I would say, um, by our consciousness that print had characteristics which now are quite different in respect to the digital, you know, including, of course, uh, paper, uh, the shape of the page, the way we handle the page, um, the um, portability. Um, I mean, I was just going to say that, you know, I carry these in my handbag and I read them on the bus and, you know, and so on. It's a different, it's a different kind of material culture that carries with it a, uh, to say nothing of how it's set and ink and so on. Okay, so 
we have um, much larger groups uh, than publishers, as it were, uh, producing this work. Much of the work is not individual. These, they're, they're, colla they're collaborative. And it's something that I found when I did that AHRC project between 2004 and 2009, um, that it was very um, um, uh, curious because I was so used to working individually even though I'd edited lots of things. I mean, to work collaboratively with you know, five different groups of people and so on is quite a different thing than writing your own articles or you know, work. And that's something that I think many of us who you know, move into larger projects with grants um, are experiencing um, that didn't um, compose the notion of the isolated scholar working you know, um, in his or her study. Um, so, um, so the British Library published some of these in partnership with private companies, um, as it's very interesting that the British Library thought that they could go it alone when they started publishing 19th century British periodicals and then decided they couldn't. And they almost immediately abandoned the HRC conditions and, you know, and then worked with, uh, in the first instance, I think it was Gale. So, um, the HRC commissioned digitized bundles of titles as well, such as the 19th century British Library newspapers, and its latest iteration, um, the British Newspaper Archive, um, which unusually is available to individuals at an economical annual fee. This is quite a move that we are now having, you know, this bundle uh, actually, you know, available to individual scholars and not only sold to institutions. So the digital publishers are unwilling, mainly, to deal with individuals. That's basically, I mean, it's a fascinating situation. Um, now, also that came out of the, the AHRC, an addition of titles, uh, an addition of titles, such as NCSE, the idea that periodical um, runs might be edited. Um, um, and we also have an index of the incidence of science in selected titles, such as SIPA, which Sally was um, a major part of, and a project on 19th century woodcuts. Um, Leverhulme supported John Drew's remarkable uh, Dickens journalism online, which is a freely accessible um, edition of two uh, of the two weeklies, um, and available in very interesting formats there in facsimile and transcriptions, you know, simultaneously, and also in audio, so that people without sight can hear them. Uh, and there's a plethora of supporting materials on that site. So, you know, that kind of bringing together of, you know, a scholarly, uh, the potential of digital in a scholarly edition is, is really one of the great richnesses, it seems to me, of digital publication. At the same time, born digital periodicals, such as Birkbeck's 19, an interdisciplinary journal of Victorian studies that Hillary spearheaded and which is now over a decade old, um, and um, the Journal of European Studies, uh, which is part of the organization of Ms. Esprit, which is a newborn. These have both entered the market um, and, um, you know, uh, as standalone, free, digitally accessible um, journals. And now, older print journals are developing digital presences in the forms of blogs, contents lists, discussion forums, pre-publication access to articles and indeed news around the, the periodical. So in a way, we are now in a position where I think print, no, yeah, print, I mean, no, certainly print is really not um, in its, is not um, enough. Print is not enough, I think, for even for print publication. They need to make digital access um, available to their readers and to keep interest in the title. I really, you know, I think that that's now uh, very evident. Um, one of the principal topics of critical discourse during this period is how the remediation of historical manuscripts has added to our understanding of titles already in distinctive 19th century formats. So what I'm suggesting is that, of course, in the 19th century, periodicals were not in a single format either. They were, they appeared first as single issues, but then they appeared in volumes. They appeared in multiple editions. Um, and digital forms that we now access periodicals in are part of the successive forms that periodicals um, have taken in their own period. And I'll say a bit more about that. 
Um, it is no accident that all of these projects, digital and paper, are collective, involving many contributors and producers. As press work, even of a single century and nation, is a daunting corpus across disciplines and nations. So Waterloo, although it's ostensibly about you know, British periodicals, it has different volumes for Scotland and Ireland. So you know, even the national notion uh, is, uh, break, it is breaking up. But they deploy, and I'll, I, would, um, I would echo um, Liz point, Liz's point about our tendency to look at national corpuses of, of the press, um, because what we have here is international um, contributors um, who are uh, drawn to, um, um, to provide their expertise of individual specialists in single titles. So they have, you know, they know a particular journalist or they know a particular editor, um, they know particular journals. So, you know, the quarterly review over 100 years, that's quite a, an area of knowledge. Um, and, you know, and then in, in types such as family magazines, um, penny papers, uh, weeklies, art journals, illustrated papers, the law press, these all have, you know, a range of, you know, small number of experts who, who actually do know uh, the titles and um, participants, uh, the journalists, um, um, f closely and in detail. Parliamentary reporting, um, we've just had a new work by Kathy Waters um, on special correspondence. You know, so th these, I mean, and that's hard won. That was a three-year, you know, uh, grant uh, from, I believe, the HRC. So, and the other thing about this collaborative work is that it draws graduate students into the, the learning community. You know, for the dictionary, we use graduate students. Very often, part of the um, projects involve uh, postgrads, postdocs, and, and um, other graduate students. You may have realized now that the field is not English literature or history or art history. Drawing mainly on these three originally, it is now multidisciplinary, still part of the Victorian Studies project. And current work, I would say, on the press is necessarily cross-disciplinary, given that 19th century titles are normally miscellanies rather than specialist papers. And to hoik out a single element of significance to a single discipline is almost always to take no account of the title and the medium. So, you know, I remember in the past meeting um, students who thought that uh, Blackwoods was a literary magazine. You know, and that was because there was fiction in Blackwoods. But actually, all you had to do was look at the table of contents and look at the travel articles, the science, the law, the politics, the, you know, to realize that, you know, of course it wasn't a literary magazine. Um, and I think that business of, you know, um, what you were talking about, um, um, you know, taking chunks uh, to your, uh, to beat your disciplinary, um, um, norms is, is um, you know, not a wise course. Um, so we have newly constituted interdisciplinary fields, uh, several, that have emerged over years of gestation, a number of which have their own journals, um, each with its own uh, emphases and suggestions of what is embraced. So we have media history, which actually discusses print in relation to film and, and radio and television and so on. We have history of the book, which um, I remember when that phrase and, and book history was coined, it, it was allowed that periodicals might, you know, sneak through the door. Um, print culture, journalism, newspaper history, and periodical studies. So all functions as disciplines for scholars in, quote, this field. You know, it's, it's still forming and multifaceted. There is a discernible movement to treat newspaper and periodical studies together as constituents of the cultural and industrial formation of the press. And we see this in the Waterloo, which treats both newspapers and periodicals. Uh, Andrew King and, um, and his colleagues attempt to do this in the book. DNCJ does it, uh, NCSE does it, and also some fields do it, for example, um, media history. Um, but it is a very slow business and scholars who have been brought up in separate disciplines really have difficulties crossing these boundaries. People who do newspaper history do not feel comfortable in respect to periodicals and vice versa. Um, so 
for example, what we have is the relating of what has historically been studied separately as parallel sets of, sets of linear histories, each with its own bibliography, its own colleagues, its own conferences, and sometimes its own journals. So that is a real, you know, really slow generational kind of move. But they are not but that they are not culturally separate is plain, involved as they are in closely interlocking networks with overlapping proprietors, printers, journalists, distributors, presses, and advertising. So when I use the term periodicals in my title, I am referring to 19th century serials more generally. And together, the terms serials and periodicals suggest the key elements of the press, repetition and frequency. Um, and they include a range of print titles, newspapers and magazines, dailies, weeklies, monthlies, quarterlies, annuals, and all of these recur over time, usually at regular intervals. Not always, but usually. Um, the character of serials is, you know, even individual titles is not unitary. The canny publishers of many 19th century titles did not confine them to a single frequency, I, I regret to say. <laughs> Dailies had multiple editions in a single day. Now, one of the losses, you might say, of, you know, the times of the Times, the, the digital you know, edition of the Times, is that they may only publish one edition. You know, and you're not always sure which. Um, and uh, so um, we have you know, multiple editions in newspapers and in weekly newspapers. Uh, weeklies fairly frequently appear in aggregated monthly issues. For example, Household Words appeared as a weekly, but it was also bound as a monthly. Uh, both Dickens periodicals. Monthlies, quarterlies, and the rest were normally repackaged and distributed in six monthly or annual bound library editions. And some entire runs of titles were reprinted in new editions decades after their first, experience, uh, their first appearance, especially when new series began, under the impetus of a new printer, format, editor, or publisher. The Yellow Book is a very famous example of that. However, while some content was extrapolated and republished in pamphlet form, for example, or brought together commonly in a bound volume of fiction, on the whole, the miscellany of articles, the magazine of contents, was what was protected and perpetuated in these multiple editions, despite the loss of certain paratextual elements like um, adverts and um, uh, tables of contents and so on. Arguably, in this sense, the core contents of the, period, of the serial was as bound as an, edi as an edition of a book and it was intended to survive as a whole. Serials were not ephemeral if the publisher could help it. Uh, <laughs> the publisher was having multiple you know, attempts to garnish um, um, uh, profit from the uh, product. The tension between the date stamp of the serial when it first appeared and retrospective reading of the archive is in reprinted form is notable in the many serials that provided annual indexes for their library editions, so the volume. So in these bound volumes, the alphabetical order of the index, which was by title of the article or by subject, very, little, very seldom by author, this, this alphabetical order suppressed the boundaries of the separate issues inside as they sought to legitimate this new aggregated format. The indexes that were usually bound at the front of the volume served as tables of contents and while they expressed the aspiration of the publisher to the longevity of the volume, they willfully obscure the dated issues inside. The 19th century tension between the original ordered and shaped contents of numbers and the aspirational shape of the volumes expressed in the indexes already challenges the coherence of the single issue and voices the constant threat of its fragmentation into constituent parts in the 19th century. Of course, we use indexes too. The search function of digital software for aggregations of 19th century titles, a tiny percentage was digitized, uses an invisible index of coded metadata that materially fragments discourse, not to say issues, into fragments for copy and paste, a mode that is prone to obscure or even lose understanding of location in time, issue, and discourse. The quotation element of scholarly argument where snippets constitute evidence has married perhaps even resulted in software that deletes a valuable aura of meaning. 
It is one of the developing characteristics of media replication that user interfaces privilege searching and increasingly obscure the software's capacity to offer browsing functionality. So we find, or we don't, what we are looking for. Instead of the serendipity that often arises from browsing pages, articles, and issues. Paul Fife has a fascinating piece in Victoria Periodical Review last year about the high incidence of accidents in research. Arguably, the tension between um, the issue and retrospective access in remediated forms is the same challenge that 21st, ser 21st century serials and indeed books face once they are accessible in digital formats. Contemporary serials, print and digital, Journal of Victorian Culture and Victorian Periodical Review, as well as born digital titles such as 19 and the Journal of European Periodicals, um, are probably read, I would argue, as frequently in parts located by searching through Project Muse or Google as they are through browsing. That is, by the user turning the printed pages of JVC or VPR, or in the case of digital, by going to the websites of 19 or, um, or Journal of uh, European and Periodical Studies. A notable difference of these two sets of titles is that the digital titles, of course, are, are uh, sorry, the paper titles are paid subscription titles um, that only publish their table of contents free online and distribute selections from their contents through aggregators, which are also paid, such as Project Muse, while the two internet journals, 19 and JEPS, are open access. It seems to me that at this juncture, material culture issues arise, which can help articulate the liniments of the ideal research environment. Faced with a linear list, and I put this to you, I'm, I'm really interested to hear your reading practices. Faced with a linear list of hyperlinked titles in internet journals, how many user readers will settle down for an afternoon or an evening of an issue? And how many will return to the issue to continue browsing through it on later occasions? While the digital serial has a far wider reach than printed paper through the World Wide Web, its hardware, its weight, its screen size, its dependence on power and powering up, and perhaps its dependence on silence, you know, on a kind of studied environment, and a study environment, combine to make it less conducive than the codex to the sustained reading over time that reading scholarly articles and issues involves. It's possible that, picture is that paper issues of serials invite reading over time better, particularly at the moment of receipt when they still possess the aura of the new, as they are carried in pockets, um, backpacks or jackets through the city. And I, and I suspect more of the issue is read at this occasion, that first occasion, and its shape taken on board. However, once the current issue is superseded by the latest issue and it becomes part of an archive, then its digital form takes precedence. It is findable, I suspect, where is that bloody July issue? It's under some you know, desk or table or pile. The digital is searchable, and if you're lucky, there may even be blog posts or forum exchanges about it. So with print, historical and contemporary, it is always best to have access, I would say, to both digital and paper. What does the digital-born uh, periodical do about this? this balance about reading and, and, and the characteristics. As I suggested earlier, I think that the reading environment and presentation are significantly different than print. Early in its history, it was clear that one of its advantages over print was the ease and cheapness with which illustration and graphics could be included. 19 quickly took advantage of this. Also, in place of routinely produced print, design and color played a greater part in the attractiveness of mastheads, title pages, um, etc. And it looked more akin to expensive print objects. But in addition to these familiar characteristics of digital formats to which we have become accustomed, it has to be said, such as searching, uh, copying and pasting of text, scholarly online journals now have developed other capabilities that encourage them other form, that encourage other forms of use than reading of text. The activity of the user is increasingly extended beyond reading of this inert text to follow links, to listen to podcasts, to comment, to correct, to participate in editorial work in groups that form powerfully connected online communities. Another aspect of 19 and JEPS is that they have adopted a practice of publishing special or themed issues, which in its enhancement of continuities, that is between articles, locks the reader into the issue which is visibly shaped by an implicit scholarly editor who is named. The brand of the periodical title merges with the theme of the special issue 
its editor and the named contributors to draw the online reader into the issue and perhaps back to it at the time of issue, but especially, I think, retrospectively. There's one other further aspect of these journals, uh, the online journals share with their 19th century ancestors, and that is their affiliation with what John North calls an issuing body. So think the Metaphysical Society for the 19th century and the Contemporary Review, the Methodist for the Methodist Recorder, and the Chartist for the um, Northern Star. All these organizations offer distribution and sales points, very you know, important, uh, and correspondence. Both 19 and, and um, JEPS are the organs of issuing bodies, and I'm thinking here of Esprit and the Center for 19th Century Studies, uh, which have annual conferences, um, it bring, they bring people together, and they stage events like this one. Okay. Thank you. <laughs>